Jesus Christ set aside his Godhead. glad you're here. We've got two last weeks in Galatians, today and next Sunday. Next Sunday, I will not be here and able to teach the final lesson, and I hate that, but uh, Pastor David Fleming will be here in my stead. He will be teaching next Sunday, so uh, I hope you'll be here. A chance to love on him and a him to love on you, and also to finish this class. Special shout out and thanks to him. Now, today's lesson I've entitled Family Talk. And the reason why is because that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk as family. And so family is something that's very, very important. I looked up reasons that family are important and I found a website that gives the top 10 reasons for everything. And I looked at their top 10 reasons that family is important. I thought they were kind of interesting. Number one, it sets the stage for future relationships. You know, if, if you grow up in a home where the, the, the father uh, is kind to the mother, then the boys grow up, hopefully, to be kind to their wives. Uh, it, 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 there's a very significant relationship between the kind of home in which you grow up and how you handle future relationships. The second, people rely upon their families in challenging times. I think we certainly have seen that. Now, these are healthy families. There are a lot of people that don't grow up in healthy families. In fact, some people grow up in a family where they see the, the, the mother and the father uh, in an abusive relationship. And instead of growing up abusers themselves, they say, I want to be anything but what I grew up with. And it helps them change who they are. But these are indicators of a healthy family, a good family. Number three, it's a source of, of encouragement and a source of affection uh, you know, I know that my sisters and my brother-in-laws are going to love me and encourage me and uplift me. I know that my mother would take a bullet for me. That's just the kind of, of, of resilience we've got. My wife will, will go to the greatest lengths to take care of me and my needs and, and my emotions and everything. It's, it's part of a healthy relationship. Number four. It gives a sense of belonging to something greater than one's self. Because you're part of a family. You're not an island. Uh, number five, it's a basis for um, other healthy relationships. When you're in a good family, you feel confident in reaching out and being with others. And that's a marvelous thing too. Number six, family relationships are linked to mental health. Not the only link, obviously. But if you grow up in a healthy, strong family, you are more likely, statistically, to have strong mental health. Number seven, it's actually linked to academic performance. Uh, I had a case one time where uh, uh, it was a, a bizarre case, but it involved uh, one of the, the, the people integral to the case was a young lady who was in her 20s. And she had been adopted out of a home when she was about four or five. She got put into the home when she was three. When the, the authorities realized that her mother, who was so strung out on dope, never fed her, never did anything with her. And so this is a child that as an infant was just left crying in the crib almost all the time, unless a neighbor heard it so much that they came over, lying in their, the, their own... Um, dirty diaper lying in her own and, and, it, and it affected her tremendously because of the way she was brought up and, and she, her brain did not develop in the ways that it should have developed because of the way she was brought up in an unhealthy family. So a good family is linked to academic performance. Families teach important life lessons. I can tell you many lessons I learned from my mother and my father and from my older sister. I've even learned a few from my younger sister, though I don't admit it publicly. Number nine, families teach values. 
you learn your core values from your family. And if you're in a good family, you learn good values. If you're in a family where the values aren't very good, you've got to fight the tendency to learn bad values. Number 10, healthy families make a healthy society. And that's why so many governments work to instill healthy families because the healthy family is the backbone of a healthy society. Mother Teresa had a great quote. She said, what can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. And I really like that because family is very significant. It's very important. So what I'd like to do in family talk today are three things. First, let's just look at what Paul says about family talk in Galatians 6, 1 through 6. Second, we're going to talk about God because family talk is tied into God talk. And then third and finally, we're going to get a pep talk. So with those three talks before us, let's get started with family talk. Here's where we start, Galatians 6, 1. Paul begins, we'll read the first verse together. Brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now the first word that Paul's got there is brothers. It's adelphoi, uh, adelphoi in the Greek, excuse me, the accent's at the end, adelphoi in the Greek. And adelphoi is a plural form of brothers. Adelphoi, especially in the plural form, can mean brothers and sisters. So don't think this, he's just talking to the men. The, the, the Greek word itself can mean brother and sister when used in the plural form. Paul says, but, but it's the idea is it's someone from the same womb. And so Paul is talking to the Galatian church as his brothers and sisters, not just in the friendly sense, like, hey sister, how you doing today? Or hey brother, I hope everything's good. But in a true familial sense, in a true sense of from the same womb, family, truly family. And I love this because this is family talk. This is something of mutual obligation that we've got being family. Our problem here is we're a big family in this class. I tease Miss Carolyn about being my second mother. And people think, well, are you in an interracial family? Yes, I am. This is my interracial family. And we've got people of all cultures, all ages, all social demographics in here. And we're all from the same womb when we're all part of Christ. We're all family together. And that carries with it mutual obligations. You to me, me to you, and you to each other. And it's really tough to do in a family this big. But that's why we have smaller groups. That's why Lorraine's got the women's ministry where the women get together. That's why Coach Max has the men's ministry where the men get together. We've got connection groups. <clears throat> we've got lots of different ways we try to break this down so that we've got smaller family units that can know each other and fulfill some of the family obligations we've got. I got really stoked this morning. Because I got here early. And I got a chance to visit with my family. And that's a real treat for me to get to talk to you. Because when this is over, we've got to get to church. But, so, brothers, he starts out. Brothers, if anyone is caught, caught in any transgression. Now, that's an interesting word, caught. Prolambano in the Greek is, is, uh, is a taking or a doing, but it's got an element of surprise. So different Bible translations translate this differently because the question is, in a sense, is this where the person got surprised as they got caught up in a sin? The sin jumped in and surprised them? Not a premeditated sin, but one that was just like, ah, oh, I'm trapped. Or... Is the word an emphasis on the idea being that they got caught? And that was the surprise. They thought it was going to be a secret. And they got nailed. 
And so the translators struggle with that. Because it's, it's kind of unclear what Paul means in that way. And if you look at some Bible translations, the English Standard Version and the New International Version use caught. But the Revised Standard Version and American Version use overtaken, like it surprised the sinner. I really like what Dr. Fung said about it in uh, the New International Commentary on the New Testament, in the, chapter, uh, the book on Galatians. He said... The New English Bible, do something wrong on a sudden impulse, captures the probable meaning of the Greek verb, which speaks not of intentional sin, but inadvertent wrongdoing. In other words, someone has, on a sudden impulse, done something wrong. Someone is doing things they shouldn't be doing. They're caught up in something they shouldn't be caught up in. And when that happens, in any transgression, and um, um, peripatoma, the word for transgression here, isn't the typical word for sin, though it contains sin, but it's, it's the idea of a wrongdoing, a, a transgression. So um, if anyone's caught in any transgression or wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. Now I love this verb Paul's using for restore. Remember, Paul uses picture words like crazy. Paul's words themselves are PowerPoint because he's got pictures with these words. Um, Catarizzo is, is no exception. It means to cause something to be in condition to work well. I say means. Means isn't quite an accurate word anytime you're translating, but it conveys the sense of cause it to be in condition to work well. So when you read this in, in different places in the Bible and outside the Bible in ancient Greek, you'll read it with the idea of restoring, like restoring furniture so that it works well, or renovating a home so that it works well, or fixing a car okay well they didn't fix cars back then but fixing something so that it works well in fact in Matthew 4 this is the verb used where it says going on from there Jesus saw two other brothers James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father mending their nets Caterizzo is the verb there mending it means they were fixing it they were fixing the nets, causing it to work well again. And that's what this verb means. Cause it to be in a condition to work well. The net's busted, fix the net. So if someone's caught in a transgression, they're not working well. Sin does that to us. Sin affects how well we work. And Paul knew that. And Paul said, so if someone's caught up in it, you need to get them fixed so they're working well. So that they're humming, as my dad would have said. Now you're humming. Or what's the expression of the patriarch in uh, Duck Dynasty? Now you're cooking with peanut oil. I mean, it's, it's that type of thing. You've got to get it working well. Something is, is it, I mean, look. Are they going to hell because they sinned? Paul's covered that. But that doesn't mean they're not interfering with themselves and by extension the family life, the community life. And so what Paul wants is get it fixed so that it's working well. And to do that in a spirit of gentleness. Now I, I like this. The spirit in a spirit of gentleness. Remember Galatians 5 22 through 23 which is right before the section we're reading now. Paul talked about the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness or goodness faithfulness gentleness same word gentleness and, and this word gentleness, I, I, I like the way it was put by uh, 
this is a standard Bible lexicon, for lack of a better way of saying it. Proutes, the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. We think of gentleness simply as tender care, like you've got a raw egg in a spoon on an egg race. You know, you want to be gentle. But this is more, it conveys also an idea of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. So it's got gentleness in it, but it's also got humility wrapped up in this word. Courtesy, consideration. This word's translated meek in places. Not in the sense of, uh, you know, wimpy, but in the sense of, of humility and gentleness and kindness. The meekness that Jesus had. The meekness that Moses had. That's what we've got in this. And so that's a fruit of the Spirit. So it seems right that in a spirit of gentleness, of this fruit, we should restore such a one. We don't restore them by going to them and saying, Well, you're a terrible sinner. You're an embarrassment to me. You're an embarrassment to the family. You need to get your act in gear right now. Otherwise, I don't know. It's just a mess. No. Don't go to him and say, you know, I've never been caught in this sin because I'm above it. Let me lead you out of it. Follow me, the wise one. No. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying in a spirit of, of gentleness, of of, of humility and, and Paul goes on to add to it he says and, and keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted you know don't think that you're above it and so you're going to leave them out of it recognize that this can be a problem for everyone to get caught into transgression to get caught into sin and we have a family obligation to get people working well again and to help them. But to do it with humility and do it with gentleness because we can be tempted too. Remember the verse immediately before Galatians 6.1 said this. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, envying one another. Those are transgressions. So if you see someone that's just caught up in envying someone with humility to try to correct them, say, well, who's going to know if I'm envying someone? We may not be close enough as a family for you to pick up on that. But that's why we need to be in, in connection with people. We need connections. You need prayer partners. You need uh, uh, people close to you within the body of Christ so that they do know what you're going through and they are able to pick up on things hey you doing okay I know that's got to be real tough on you man if I were in your shoes I'd be real tempted to envy or you catch someone provoking someone else just getting them because they can and it doesn't hurt to say hey time out you know, you, look, I'm as guilty as anybody of this. That may be why I can see it. But you, you, you know, maybe throttle back a little bit. Um, uh, I love one of the things our son-in-law, JT, did with our daughter, Gracie, when they were courting. And, and JT, Gracie, was rightfully over the moon over this fella. He's as fine a Christian young man as you're ever going to find. And um, Gracie was, was caught up in a transgression, in a sense. She was really angry and not being very nice about it. And JT just calmly looked at her and, and said, and she said, I'm sorry, I know I'm not being nice. And he says, oh, but you will be because I don't date girls who aren't nice. <laughs> and she was like, you're right, you're right. And he kind of laughed. 
And he says, just like you don't date boys who aren't nice, so I better be nice too. And they had a good laugh over it. But I just love that. There's a spirit of gentleness. JT is also the one who's responsible. We pray before we eat. Okay, It's just a family thing. JT grew up in a family where they pray before they eat. And if someone doesn't express gratitude to God for the food beforehand and starts eating, that's who has to say the prayer. <laughs> including in a restaurant. And so we know you go eat Mexican food with JT, man, you better thank God for the food before you put the chip in your mouth or you're the one having to do it. <laughs> but it's this restore such a one. I mean, this isn't just talking about someone who, who does one of the big sins. This whole thing is one of trying to grow before the Lord in all of these different kinds of ways. And this is a great example of, of life by the Spirit rather than simply following rules. Paul doesn't simply say, here, do these Ten Commandments. Now you're fine. He's talking about attitudes. He's talking about the heart. The Spirit is trying to change us and grow us from the inside out. There's not a Ten Commandments that says, uh, get more self-control. But if by the fruit of the Spirit you grow in self-control, you're better able to keep the commandments. You progress, you grow. And that's what Paul's talking about here. So he continues, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now if you were reading this in the Greek, there's a real emphasis here in the way Paul writes on one another's burdens. Because what he does is he starts his sentence with it. He doesn't start his sentence with the verb, bear, the imperative instruction. He starts the sentence with alelon tabare. It's, it's this idea of, of another's burdens. Bear them. And he moves it to the front of the sentence for emphasis. So the start of this sentence in the Greek is someone else's burdens, weight challenges you bear you help you help someone and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ as opposed to that Old Testament law that was bondage the law of Christ the law that says what you want others to do to you you do to them but the law that also says to forgive others. The teaching of Christ that also says to bear one another's burdens. That's what we're to do. That's family. So Paul continues in verse 3. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing. Now I love that. I love it in the Greek. Uh, uh, thinks... That something he is when nothing he is. You think you're something when you're nothing? You're fooling yourself. I mean, really? <laughs> really? You're deceiving yourself. And this deceiving... This is, this is in the present tense, which means moment by moment, day by day. You start thinking more highly of yourself. Oh, I'm going to help you poor sinner because I can't. You have just become the Pharisee in Jesus' story of the Pharisee and the publican. Where the Pharisee says... Well, the publican, first, let's start with him. He's there and he's beating his chest. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, the Pharisee says, Lord, thank you that I'm not like that sinner over there. Okay? And then we read that and we think, self-righteous Pharisee, I'm so glad I'm not like him. That's not where we need to be. We need to be on the publican side of that. 
We need to be on the side that says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. So when we're dealing with someone else in our family who's got sin, it's not, look, we don't have any problem. Let me help you out of it. It's one of tenderness and humility. And if you don't think that you need help in your life as well, and you think you're something high and mighty and above it all, then you're walking moment by moment, minute by minute in a great deception. And that's very sad. So Paul says, let each one... Now, I'm going to warn you. This verse is weird. Let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. I thought we weren't supposed to boast. Doesn't the song say, forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord? And then here Paul puts this thing out here. Let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. It just seems to grow contrary to everything Paul's been saying. So let's dig for just a moment. Let me suggest to you that part of the insight of understanding what Paul's talking about can be found if we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 through 18. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says the following. We will not boast beyond limits. We'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned to us to reach, even to you. We're not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We don't boast beyond limit in the labor of others. Our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. His boasting as he looked at this situation was a boasting in Christ and what he had done. And so he's saying, look, you need to spend time also looking at yourself. And if you've got a reason to boast, it's not in comparison to your neighbor. It's only because Christ has worked in you and you can thank God for that. But it doesn't change his admonition earlier to correct others in a spirit of humility with caution because there but for the grace of God go I. I really like the way the message paraphrased this passage in translation. The message said, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given by God and sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can do with your own life. And that's what Paul, in essence, is saying, I think. So let the one who's taught the word, and this sums this up, uh, sums up this section of what we're doing. Let the one who's taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, I love to talk about this verse because I'm not on staff at the church. I'm, I get to be a part of the church. I get to contribute to the church. But we all need to know that this church consists of people whose full-time job in ministry is trying to teach and to reach. And it is not just a pleasure and an honor but it is seemly and right for us to share with this church's ministry effort. And, 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 and Paul can write that because Paul made tents to support himself so no one would ever challenge his message as being one that was lining his pockets. It's one reason that, that I always want to be careful. I mean, God has blessed us abundantly. And I never want to say, hey, give us $100 at the library and you can take a course. 
because that's not what this is about. None of this is selling ministry. None of this is, oh, come to this class and, and give money because I want to raise. I don't get anything from this other than the honor of following the Lord and being part of our family. And this is my family obligation to you. So it allows me to tell you one brother to another, brother and sister, don't forget how important it is that all of us contribute to share good things with the ones who are teaching. It's just a chance to do that. And this is family talk, so I'm allowed to say such things to us. And I'm speaking to myself as well. All right? Next, let's look at God talk. I really like this. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that also will he reap. Don't be deceived. Me planaste. That's a phrase that Paul uses repeatedly. It was a common phrase in the time of Paul. It means make no mistake. Don't be misled. You, you look... This is no-brainer land. You can, you, you can be assured of this. You can be confident here. Make no mistake. God is not mocked. Now, how many of you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews or have been around a child at the age of two or three before in your entire life? Okay, most of you. We've got a grandson, and he's got a great age. Actually, we've got two grandsons. But one that, that uh, uh, I hope to see next weekend, which is why I won't be here, is John Henry. Now, John Henry is about 19 months old, 18 months old. And you know he's almost old enough for the song, Head... Shoulders, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and... Or, as we say in Greek, muktir. Muktir, where's your muktir? Where's your muktir? That's nose. Now... That's turned into kind of a verb of sorts here. God is not muktirizod. It's from muktir. Nose. God is not muktirizod. Don't turn your nose up on God. Don't sneer at God. Don't mock God. Don't think for a moment that God's going to be by you. Because if you think you're pulling one over on God, you're flat wrong. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. Me planaste. Don't, don't for a moment think that you can turn your nose up on God and sneer and mock God. See what I mean by Paul uses these words with just great visuals? I love it. God's not mocked. See, whatever someone sows, that also will they reap. This is a fundamental principle. This is as true as true can be. You want to sow destruction in your life, you can do that. You want to sow joy in your life, you can do that. I was giving the graduation address to a law school class at a law school uh, in uh, Queens, New York, called St. John's. And uh, uh, I told them, and, and this is, it's a Jesuit university, but by and large a secular law school to some degree. 
um, uh, 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 even though it's rooted firmly and, and it's got a very good administration, the dean's a good fella, a good devout Catholic fella, and, and so is uh, a number of the people there. But I wasn't giving a religious commencement address. I was giving one that was just trying to tell these people how to be a good lawyer. But I got to tell you, almost everything I said was drawn upon biblical principles of how to behave. You can't succeed in this world in a true sense if you're not truly investing and sowing in things that are good and right and honorable and pure and lovely and of good repute. And you won't succeed. Oh, you may say, oh, look, I won this case or, oh, I got rich. Doesn't matter. I can show you a host of rich lawyers who won cases who did not succeed in life. You want a field of corn? You need to sow corn. This is cosmic karma of sorts. You reap what you sow. Not karma in the eastern sense of reincarnation based on what you've done. Based in this life on what you've done. Don't be mocked. Don't think that just because God loves you, He lets you do anything you want with no consequences. It's because He loves you that there are consequences. We live in a cause and effect world. Set up by a cause and effect God. And Paul doesn't want you deceived. And so he continues, the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. I mean, you get to choose where you sow your seed. It's your call. It's your pick. Do you want to sow your seed in what we have now? Do you want to sow your seed in your lusts and cravings and desires? Is it more important to you to be popular than it is to, to do right? Is it more important to you to have economic success than it is to be honest? Is it more important to you to please your flesh than to please your maker? Whose only concern is your real good? Or do you want to sow to the Spirit? Because all of the practical advice that Paul's giving us is rooted in who God is. We're made in His image to reflect who He is and to live as He would. And if you want that wonderful life, that's what we should be doing. And when you see someone who's caught up in a transgression and you're close to them as family, then it's a time in humility to encourage and to get them working well again. So the whole body is thriving. All right, that's enough God talk. Well, not, I mean, like, that's not a good thing to say. All right, let's quit talking about God now and move on to something else. No, the God talk permeates all of this, so excuse me. But I want to transition now to the third section, the pep talk. Paul says it in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I love this. Paul starts it out with doing good. So he starts out with, but the, the good things you're doing. Actually, it's not you, it's us. That's a, 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 a first, uh, the plural, first plural, isn't it, David? Yeah, that's us. So now Paul's put himself in this, which is really special. So he's, he's given himself the pep talk. So doing good. Doing good, let's not grow weary. Let's not grow weary. And kako here is, is um, 
Ankako is the, the verb, and it's present tense, and it, so it's talking about right now. And again, first person plural. Right now, don't let discouragement, don't let fear keep you from doing what you should, day by day, minute by minute. Do it. And you say, yeah, but this is terrible. I'm miserable. I've got friends undergoing family issues that the uh, illness and impending death. I have a dear friend, a lawyer, uh, who died yesterday morning. Um, uh, you read the obituary in the New York Times. He and I have had a number of cases together over the last 20 plus years. He's been in my home on countless times. I've been in his. He's uh, 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 friends with Becky, friends with our family, dear friends and mentors to many of the lawyers in my firm. And is not on this earth today. And, and there's so much. Uh, I've got a, a, a dear friend, a missionary buddy, who, who was basically put in a position to believe he had a job offer here in the States and was coming back for it. And, and came in the midst of all of this COVID problem, came here, traveled here trying to, to interview to get the final rubber stamp of yes we're hiring you left his family in, in the east came here only to find out at the last minute they decided not to offer him the job and he can't get back home right now because of COVID and he's left his wife and his kids there on the mission field and I just want to say to him I want to say to all of my friends I want to say to everybody don't let discouragement Keep you from doing good and doing what you ought to do. Just keep going. Keep on trucking. Don't let fear. For some people it's not discouragement, it's fear. I'm just afraid I'm not going to be able to make ends meet. Don't let fear or discouragement keep you from doing good. Don't grow weary, as they say. I want to show you how this verb is used in a couple of passages because it's really important. Um, Ankakeo is the verb. Uh, 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 I didn't spell it right in English. It should have an, an E there for the epsilon, but it's ankakeo. Um, don't let discouragement or fear keep you. Look at Luke 18, 1. Jesus told them a parable to the effect they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Same verb. Don't let discouragement. Well, I'm praying, but God doesn't seem to answer. Doesn't matter. You pray anyway. God's at work here. Now, the result of the work may not be what you want it to be. The answer to the prayer may not be, okay, you got it. Appreciate you praying. The answer to the prayer may be, I'm so sorry. I can't do that because of the way this has got to work out. But my heart is with you and I love you and I'm crying with you because God cries with us. That may be the answer to the prayer. I'll weep with you, I'll mourn with you, I'll grieve with you and I'll also give you the promise hope. But Jesus still says you keep praying because God's at work in that prayer both in you and the world. Look at this passage from Ephesians where Paul uses the word in kakeo. So I ask you, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Don't think, don't get scared, don't be discouraged just because I'm, I'm in trouble for the word. Don't let discouragement or fear keep you from doing what you should because in due season... Because Cairo Gar Idio is translated in due season. Now, Cairo is one of two Greek words for time that are used extensively. There are two Greek words for time. Oops, let's get this over. One is Kairos. And the other one is chronos. These are two Greek words. In English that would be K-A-I-R-O-S and eh, C-H. Do you do a C-H for that, David? 
C-H-R-O-N-O-S, chronos. Now they're both translatable as time, but there's a nuanced difference in meaning between the two. Chronos, can you think of a time word that's got chronos in it? Chronological, chronology, chronology. And that's like a timeline, right? What order things came in, okay? Kairos is a little bit different. Kairos is what Paul uses here, and it's translated. It's in this form, Cairo. It's in a dative form. But Kairos is a particular moment of time, a propitious moment of time. It's not chronology time. It's not time of a watch per se, but it's emphasizing a, 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 a unique moment in time. Of, uh, uh, and that's why they translate it here, season. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a propitious moment. It's a special moment. And Paul draws it even closer when he says, um, uh, uses the word idios. Uh, uh, it's again in the dative because it modifies time. But idios means uh, private and personal as opposed to public. You use the, do you know what word we get from that? Idiom, not idiot. <laughs> idiom. An idiom is like a way we, uh, an expression we use. You know, I, I, Tim's a, a, a private investigator, and my phone he's plugged in, not as his full name, but Tim007. That's my idiom for Tim, 007. Now that I've told you that, he's going to have to kill you. <laughs> no. um, an idiom is a, is a private uh, expression of sorts. So Paul is saying here, don't let discouragement keep you from doing good in spite of what's happening right now because at the right time for you, at your personal propitious moment, at the right time for you, at your private time that's, that, 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 that's right, you're going to reap as long as you don't give up. Okay? Paul then says, so then, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone. Opportunity, by the way, kairos, same Greek word for time. So then, as we have propitious moments, because our propitious moment may be what we can do for someone else. Someone else may be discouraged and, and having trouble doing good and we might be able to help meet their need. We might be able to help carry their burden. We might be able to do something good for them. So as, as we've got that unique time opportunity, let's do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the family. This is family talk. Oikos is the household, the family. The home of faith. This is family talk. This is mutual obligation. Okay? Three quick points to ponder and we go to church. First, I should have had Sister Sledge up here. We are family. I got all my sisters and brothers with me. Brothers and sisters in the household of faith. We are family. And I mean, you like everybody. Everybody's got crazy Uncle Joe. Okay, I did not reference that in terms of our president. That did not come out that way. I did not mean that politically. If you took that politically, you haven't met my crazy Uncle Joe. All right. Um, but let's also not just recognize family. Let's sow wisely. Okay? Let's sow to the spirit for life not to the flesh for corruption. And last, remember, God is not mocked. He's not. All right, let me bless you and we'll go to church. I can't wait to hear what Pastor Jarrett's got to unfold for us today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pour out your blessings on my brothers and my sisters. 
in Christ. My family of faith. Father, build up those discouraged. Strengthen those weakened. Bind the, the wounds of those aching. Give wisdom to the lost. Sight to the blind. Those who feel their prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling, Lord. Give special divine comfort and understanding that you hear them. And give us all the patience to continue to do good while we wait in due season at our personal right time for the harvest that you have promised as we sow to the Spirit. I ask this blessing in the name of Jesus by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit working among us now. Amen. See you guys in two weeks. Thank you for being here. You blessed me.